So I'm just going to follow this structure, which I think is the sort of structure Chris asked us to follow. Um, etiology, epidemiology, how to identify the disease and the clinical signs, laboratory and field applications, and then a bit about prevention and control and outbreak response. So the impact of H5N1, which I'm sure everyone in the room has heard about, um, cannot be underestimated. And Probably 500 million poultry have been culled or killed due to H5N1 alone. Nobody really knows the exact number. Uh, and probably 20 billion is an underestimate. Uh, very difficult. But what we would say is that there are really significant changes in global distribution. And there is uncontrolled spread in many areas. And I think we have to say, and this is not scaremongering, there is an increased threat to the Caribbean. And obviously I'll focus on this throughout my talk. This particular virus is unprecedented. It's now endemic in six countries or regions for a highly pathogenic avian influenza virus in history never known before. And of course associated with that we see a number of human cases. Influenza is ubiquitous in wild birds. Uh, it has a wild bird reservoir. Occasionally the virus crosses into poultry. And when it crosses into poultry, it will have a variable disease impact. And because of that, it has different transmission and pathogenesis properties. Those disease impacts will depend on the strain, the host, and there will also be environmental factors that might dictate uh, the severity or the rate of spread of the, of the pathogen. And if we think from a Caribbean perspective right now, we've got a group of viruses here, H5N2, H5N8, H5N1, this is not quite the same as those in Asia, and I'll come back to that, which are on your doorstep in, the, in North America right now. In addition to that, there's H7N3 uh, in Mexico. We're still not entirely clear whether those cases are resolved. Uh, there hasn't been an update for some time, so there is a level of uncertainty there. And obviously these problems require swift intervention and good surveillance. In order to deal with these global transboundary diseases, of course, we do need an international effort. And there has been a huge investment through organisations such as the FAO in building capability and capacity. And obviously, this course is all about building capability. Uh, we also need some long-term sustainability because these diseases and these pathogens are not going to go away very quickly. And we're going to be continually at risk of emerging threats through changes in the virus and of course the big question is, is whether we can deploy vaccination more effectively. So that's an influenza virus particle and the key thing on the structure of the virus is that there are two proteins that project from the surface. One is called the HA or the haemagglutinin and that gives rise to those H numbers which is what we use to call the virus and then the neuraminidase uh, or the N. We can divide flus into three types, A, B, and C. Almost exclusively, all those viruses of terrestrial mammal, um, animals, uh, especially birds, uh, are all type A's. B's and C's are, are really, um, might, they're not, they haven't got key animal reservoirs, so we're gonna be just talking about influenza A. Now the virus, in order to get into the cell and replicate and get out of the cell, it uses those projections on the surface, so they're really important and we've so far in nature described predominantly 16 serotypes of haemagglutinin and nine serotypes of neuraminidase. And any virus will have any one of those in any combination. So that gives you 144 combinations. Now just recently in the last few years, not far from here in Central America, uh, H17, N10 and H18, N11 have been described in bats. Uh, they've not been reported in any other host species. So for the moment I'm going to focus on these 16 and you can see that they've all been found in avian species but when we look at other mammalian, when we look at mammalian species we see a much more restricted host range and we'll be talking about swine influenza later in the meeting. And of course the key thing about flu is that once it enters a host population it undergoes what we call drift it changes through mutations over time and then occasionally we get a very big change where a new serotype emerges and that is what we call antigenic shift. 
So these viruses that are in North America now, why are they getting different numbers? They started off as H5N2, you've got H5N8, you've got H5N1. That's quite simplistic. Underneath that, there's another level of complexity because the virus has eight gene segments. And if two viruses infect the same cell, in theory, they can mix and match. And as long as you have a full set of eight genes, you could end up with new progeny virus. So this gives rise to what we call a lot of genetic diversity. And in terms of poultry, the bird select the virus that's probably the best fit, or the virus selects the bird rather. And so those ones that have the highest fitness will get selected for, and that drives a lot of diversity, which is why we see lots of different viruses. So this is a picture going back uh, many years. Um, in fact, it was looking for Newcastle disease reservoirs in wild birds, lakes up in, in, in the north of America. And they found that when they sampled these birds, they didn't just detect avian paramyxoviruses, they detected influenza. Not only that, they had very high detection rates. 26% of these feral ducks that were sampled yielded virus. And of course, that was the cornerstone of what we know today about the reservoir. And in fact, if you look in every order or family, pretty much you will find an example species from which an influenza virus has been isolated. So we have to consider any avian species has some potential susceptibility. But there are two groups that are way more important. So at the bottom here, the anatidae, or the ducks and the geese, and the charadiformes, or the shorebirds, uh, here. And that's because these two groups, particularly the ducks, are factories for producing virus. So some work that was done a long time ago now showed that 10 to the 8.7 infectious virus particles per gram of feces could be infected by a single duck a day. Now, they produce a lot of grams of feces per day. So as veterinarians, you probably know better than I. Um, that is a lot of virus. And these birds, importantly to remember, are asymptomatically infected with most strains. So although this is a picture in northern England, this could be uh, anywhere in the world. This is a lake with lots of migratory waterfowl in winter. If you sample that lake water, you would most likely find a number of influenza viruses in it. So conventionally, we have this wild bird reservoir, and the viruses exist there in what we call low pathogenic form. And occasionally, they will spread to poultry. And after sustained transmission in poultry, some strains, a restricted number, may mutate into what we call highly pathogenic avian influenza. Now this is the disease that all of the international effort is designed to try and control. There are efforts to control low pathogenic viruses, and I'll come back to that, but this is what we're really trying to protect against because these are highly lethal, fast-spreading viruses. And from time to time, there are other what we call low pathogenic viruses that do cause global panzootics, but don't have the same disease impact. Now, this was the dogma for many years until probably the late 1900s, 1996, when H5N1 emerged. And since then, we've got these other combinations that are closely related, H5N2, H5N3, and H5N8. So two of those are present in North America right now. And these are completely different because these highly pathogenic viruses can be maintained in wild birds. Previously, these could only be maintained in poultry. So if we look at transmission, if you've got your wild bird reservoir, periodically these viruses will spill over into particularly domestic ducks. But if you don't have ducks, and I don't think you rear domestic ducks here, I'm correcting something. These viruses are just as adept at going directly into galliforms, particularly chickens. And in that form, they're low pathogenic. They pass as a low pathogenic virus, and they will cause quite often a very mild infection. In fact, quite often, they will be very difficult clinically to detect, and I'll come back to that. But after transmission within that poultry or that galliform population, so it's chickens or turkeys we're talking about here, they can mutate into a virulent form and cause a very devastating disease. 
with extremely high and rapid mortality. What controls that is very complicated, um, but it's all to do with the viral genes. And this transmission and this ability to switch hosts is dictated by certain factors within the genetic makeup of the virus. How do the viruses get from wild birds into poultry? Well, we have to look at how we produce our poultry to answer that question. Um, we have geographical location. So we might place our poultry production quite close to where there's a lot of migratory wild birds. Probably not a good practice because anything that increases the potential risk for contact between wild birds and poultry is going to increase the risk of the virus crossing. And that might not be direct contact. That might be indirect contact through fomite. So I'm just going to give you a couple of examples now. Although this is in England, it could be anywhere in the world. These are fattening ducks reared outside. Now, because there's an availability of food there for those fattening ducks, that will attract wild ducks in. They co-mingle with those uh, fattening ducks, and of course that would be direct contact, and through fecal oral route transmission, that would be very easy to spread the virus. But this is Pennsylvania, 1983, H5N2, the first major outbreak with highly pathogenic avian influenza. Um, and this farmer decided that it would be aesthetically pleasing to dig a pond and attract some wild ducks in. He did that. Unfortunately, those birds did come in and it resulted in a spread of virus from here into his secure poultry sector and he had an outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza and I think at the time it cost about 10 million US dollars. That doesn't sound a lot, but that was 1983. This was a very biosecure poultry unit you can see here but he used unsanitized water here for drinking. And therefore, this water, there's nothing on it at the moment, but there was wild birds came onto that water. They shed the virus in their feces. That got into the poultry house, mutated into a virulent form, outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza. So some very simple breaches. This farm had mixed breeds on it. Ducks, chickens, turkeys, horses, um, geese. Not ideal because the more you bring different hosts into close contact, the greater the risk for cross-species transmission, and you increase your risk. This was in England. This was H5N1 in November 2000. You can see there's a large lake here. We are going towards free-range production. That's what the consumer wants. They want all their birds reared outdoors. Welfare concerns. You can see some turkey sheds just down here, and the birds were able to roam down to the edge of the lake. Large numbers of migratory waterfowl brought in the H5N1. Exposure to the turkeys, we had an outbreak. So farming practices have a big influence on the risk. Once the virus has got in, however, after primary introduction, most of what we see, of course, is secondary spread, particularly with H5N1. And we have to remember, once the virus has entered a chicken population, they're also very good at replicating the virus as well. So this study showed 10 to the 7 infectious particles per gram of feces from infected chickens, but more importantly, that infectivity can be retained in the feces for 44 days. So if you're trying to depopulate and control after an outbreak, you have to make good the environment that those birds are in as well, because the virus will persist. Now unfortunately, wild birds probably do get blamed for a lot of outbreaks unreasonably. Most of the spread of AI is through human activity. Highest risk factor, of course, is through moving live birds, but all of these activities uh, can lead to spread or have proven to lead to spread uh, in an uncontrolled way. And I'm afraid I include veterinarians in there because veterinarians visiting farms that don't follow proper biosecurity are a risk factor. Now, of course, another dimension, particularly with H5N1, is live bird markets. And in many parts of the world, I don't know how common they are here, but in many parts of the world, they're very common, particularly in the Far East. And these are a perfect breeding ground for a virus. So people come with their birds, they trade their birds, they buy birds, different species, different ages, um, different breeds, and the virus can perpetuate and spread 
uh, extremely successfully and it can be maintained in these market systems. And so H5N1, one of the key reasons why this virus has become so difficult to control is it's established in those live bird market systems in the Far East. So pathogenesis and identification of the disease. So I've already mentioned there are two pathotypes. There's the low pathogenicity form. And it's quite important we understand how to detect this through our surveillance because we heard yesterday about there's an outbreak in, in Belize, H5N2. And I read the OIE report and it's broiler breeders and the, it was picked up retrospectively through serious surveillance is my understanding. So they took bloods routinely monitoring their flocks and discovered there was infection there. I would be interested to know what the production records on the farm said because I think if they look closely, broiler breeders probably would see some reduction in eggs, okay, because you do see uh, reduction in production of eggs and you would see a reduction in feed intake. It may only be 5%. Now there could be a lot of pathogens that cause that, but you have to be thinking about low pathogenic avian influenza in a differential diagnosis in that situation. Now sometimes the spectrum of low pathogenicity can be exacerbated by other conditions. So presence of secondary bacteria may lead to something a lot more progressive and a lot more severe with, with mortality. But typically, low path flu on its own will cause very low or negligible mortality. However, the highly pathogenic form in galliforms is very distinctive. It's a severe disease, high mortality, often up to 100% within 24 to 48 hours. But today, only the H5 and the H7 viruses have been shown to have the ability to exist in a highly pathogenic form. And I'll come back to that. And so that's why, through the OIE, for international notification, we focus on H5 and H7. This is a turkey with, with, with sinusitis, with, with uh, low path infection. Uh, respiratory distress is not uncommon in galliforms, chickens and turkeys. But there could be a spectrum when we see highly pathogenic. Whilst mortality is often high, it's not always necessarily 100%. And these, these viruses at the moment are slightly attenuated compared to H5N1, particularly in ducks. Other signs could be any combination, clearly cessation of egg laying, respiratory, excessive lacrimation, uh, edema of the head, subcutaneous hemorrhages, diarrhea, neurological signs, and specified lesions at necropsy. So you do see hemorrhages in the lung uh, and the intestine, and, and sometimes in some of the other organ systems. But these signs are not pathonomic. They can give you an indicative um, suspicion of highly pathogenic avian influenza, but you certainly couldn't differentiate them from virulent Newcastle disease. So you do require laboratory diagnosis. So obviously neurological signs in chickens in coordination. Cyanotic combs. So you can see the bird on the left is a healthy bird, but these blue combing very characteristic feature. You don't necessarily see all birds with this, but in a flock you would expect to see some if you have HPAI. Hemorrhaging on the legs, high mortality. That's turkeys, but you would see a similar effect in chickens. Laying birds, you just see a slightly more progressive reduced transmission within a, a cage layer flock. So these are birds thrown out on the line that have died. It won't move quite as fast through that flock, but it will move through that flock. Now I put this up because I think there's this perception that highly pathogenic avian influenza immediately kills all the birds and you immediately see it. This is an outbreak, it, although it was in turkeys, it could equally apply to chickens. So this was in the UK, so very virulent H5N1. The virus was already present here. It's like David was saying yesterday about these, looking at these windows for introduction. Really important for your epidemiology. This, vi this virus was here at this point, but of course, this is the mortality. This wouldn't register anything with the producer. So there is a risk because it's not until it gets here, he starts seeing a climbing mortality that he calls his veterinary surgeon in. So that is a risk window and that is a problem because there's all sorts of things in production that will cause some slight blip and there's always an underlying mortality. So it's, it, it is a challenge sometimes to detect these viruses really early.